Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm thrilled actually uh, to be. Uh, I'm thrilled actually to welcome you all for this session, right? Uh, and I'm grateful for Exchange for Media for giving me this opportunity to chair this session, right? Uh, with distinguished distinguished panel. And well, myself, Vedyas Badri. I head the programmatic team at LS Digital Group, and will be moderating this session. And would like to know more about stories and the success stories and. Uh, solutions and challenges from each one of the panelists. Right before we uh, dive into our topic for today, which is how behind the programmatic success uh, stories, I would like to I would like to request panelists to introduce themselves to the audience here. Hi guys. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's a privilege to be on such a stellar panel. Uh, my name is Tushar. I lead the programmatic arm for Densu. I'm a part of Amplify, which is into trading and buying, and I've been in the industry for over 15 years now. Thanks, Tushar. Uh, thanks to Anurag and Exchange for Media for having me here today. I'm Shogata. I've been with the Tata Group, the Tata Communications, for about five and a half years now, and prior to that with uh, WPP and uh, Omnicom. Uh, uh, it's, it's been a good journey in Tatacoms and I would like to share some of that here as to how an enterprise B2B organization can leverage the benefits that programmatic has to offer and actually show tangible business results and not just, uh, you know, vanity metrics as, as we are prone to uh, get trapped into. So more of that as we speak. Thank you. Thanks, Shagata. Uh, Sachin this side, I lead digital marketing for Sipla Health. So the, this is the OTC uh, consumerized division of Zipla Pharma. So we manage brands like Nicotex, Cough Cells, Omnigel and so on. So uh, there is a notion that healthcare brands are not able to uh, build uh, digital media as good as uh, FMCG brands. So we have broken the myth over the past uh, three years, four years rather. And uh, I'll take you through uh, the journey uh, that I've had uh, before this at Group M and now at uh, Zipla Health. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Aditya. Uh, I'm part of Air India. Uh, I'm sure every one of you knows Air India. I need not uh, introduce Air India to you. I uh, head growth marketing for them and I've been with them for about more than a year now and extremely delighted to be part of this group. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, guys. So um, I would like to start with you, Sagata, right? Moving on to the first question, right? Uh, what was your first experience like in adopting programmatic as a media channel in your overall media mix, right? And did it help you fill any gaps and or let's say what gaps it helped you fill as such? So like I was saying, right, I came to Tata Communications from the agency side and uh, when you're on the agency side and Tushar can probably attest to that, uh, it one tends to think that programmatic is a way of life, right? There's, there's nothing that can exist without programmatic in, in today's digital-led marketing uh, ecosystem. And when I went to uh, uh, my boss for the, for the first time with a programmatic plan, he was like, we are in a different business. Uh, so from then to now, uh, we've, we've shown a very healthy CAGR of upwards of 30% in terms of our outcomes, in terms of our investments and so on. So, uh, getting that whole concept that programmatic is not something which is only meant for FMCG or D2C brands, but because you're talking to a customer whose, whose expectations in terms of information are, are pretty similar to what they are in other industries, and programmatic helps you deliver that with efficiency, with precision, at a very effective cost, and with the right kind of targeting and frequency that you require. It was, a, it was a mindset shift that I had to bring around and uh, that took about a couple of years, but now we are here. Uh, the gaps that it helped us fill, uh, I, think, I think all of us will attest to that and so will the audience. From a spray and pray campaign practice, we are now more uh, focused, more target, targeted, far more efficient and uh, the results are speaking for themselves. So that's, I would say, that's how the journey has been. Great, great. I mean, hearing it from you, I think it's like a pure sales thing, right? I mean, we at agencies struggle to get brands on board and programmatic. Hearing you say that it's, it has been a great success definitely will influence others also to kind of get on to programmatic. Great. Uh, I would like to move on to Aditya, right? Uh, how has been your experience in terms of adopting programmatic and uh, what gaps it helped you fill? Sure. Um, so I think uh, as most of you know, I mean, Air India is in the midst of a huge transformation and uh, I think there are almost like 
million eyes literally watching us as to what we are doing and when things are expected to change and so on and so forth. With that kind of uh, expectation, I think it's very important for us as a brand to sort of put out the communication in a very transparent manner uh, to the consumers. And that required a, you know, a channel which had huge reach. And mind you, we're not talking just about India, we're talking about globally. Uh, so I think we generally, the go-to channels for us have been you know, the usual Google and the Facebooks of the world. And uh, for us to basically evaluate something beyond that was largely uh, triggered by this need to sort of really sp spread the word out. Uh, communicate very uh, sharply about what we are doing, what is changing, uh, when is it expected to change. And I think for that re pure reason, I think we decided that we need to sort of offer a channel like a programmatic, or had a programmatic ecosystem uh, put in place to sort of spread the word, get that right word of mouth out. So I think that's where we just came into the picture. Great, great. I mean, when it is about to reach more number of people in shorter period of time with different uh, ad formats as such, I think programmatic is the channel to uh, get on with. Now, having heard from brand, of course, I know Sachin is also from brand, but I would like to hear the perspective of Tushar, who kind of comes from agency background. How has been your journey, right, managing programmatic right, at Denso? So I think I'm, I come from a slightly different perspective because coming from an agency side, things are really different. So my first experience with programmatic in fact, when I got acquainted with uh, Programmatic, it was quite transform uh, transformative because of the data-centric approach. And we get a lot of questions from our clients, you know, why we should move to Programmatic. And there's a lot of advantages. We have to, you know, prove ourselves at every point of time that why Programmatic adds value, some of which I, would, I can talk about right now, the questions and also the answers to that. Basically, you know, the marketeers earlier were restricted to limited audiences, right? They, they were working only with broader audience segments. Programmatic gives you enhanced targeting with precision at scale. Uh, a lot of clients, after talking to them over years, we have realized that they're sitting on a large pool of first party data, which was unleveraged. And only in the last four years, when this cookie less, uh, cookie, cookie less uh, narrative came into the picture, they became serious about leveraging that data, right? So Programmatic gave them the ability to leverage that first party data coupled with the insights that they are getting from their third party segments and actually activating that in real time, right? So basically they are able to harness that energy. Uh, also one of the major challenge or question comes from the client on the transparency part, right? And I think programmatic is the most transparent way of buying media because you get access to complete supply chain, right? And with the supply chain you also get to know where your ads are actually placed, what kind of performance you are getting, and with that also comes greater control. So earlier you were used to rely on publisher level data and all those things, but right now you have the complete control over the campaign. You can just shift gears at any moment of time. You can, deli uh, you, can you know, direct your budgets from one line item to the best performing one and, you know, optimize your campaigns better. Apart from that, I think while programmatic bridges all these gaps, at the same time it also gives you a lot of cost and operational efficiencies. You know, with the use of AI, today marketeers are able to, you know, uh, transfer their mundane tasks like campaign setup, execution reporting, and focus more on the strategy and the creative innovation part. So it gives you more agility, and it gives you the, a measurable, uh, measurable way of buying media. Great, great. I mean, that's purely an agency talking, right? Uh, AI, audience, creative innovations, uh, first party data, cookie less, right? Uh, hopefully, I mean, of course, it's there, uh, cookie-less uh, world is out there, but I think there is some time to reach there, but being prepared uh, on only, that front. Only thing I left out was CDP. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe CDP more to do with the brands, right? So, yeah. Fair, great, great, uh, Dushar. Now, Sachin, since you have been on both the sides of the coin, right, being on the agency side and the brand side, I would love to hear from you what has been your journey like. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Ved. So, you know, honestly, I would like to ditch uh, brand side and agency side both in this case. And my core is a media planner, so I'll come from the POV of a media planner. We all we all speak about the benefits of programmatic buying and how it has uh, helped and how it is helping right now, but nobody's talking about the transition 
that happened? Like, what was it before programmatic and what is it that programmatic came and added value to? So, if we see until 2015, 2016, programmatic was just getting launched and very few brands were uh, starting to adopt programmatic buying in a way. Before 2015, 2016, like, if, if I talk about Comscore today, most of the people won't know what Comscore is. We used to look at Comscore and whichever top categories are there, whichever top websites are there in the category, we honestly used to go and speak to those uh, websites and we used to take CPM based plans and my media plan would have been a Hindustan Times or a Times of India or it would have been uh, a money control or an economic times, all CPM buys, all duplicated media, all wastage of money. Now, uh, this was pure inventory buying. Programmatic is audience buying, the power of audience buying, that, that, that is the base of programmatic. Uh, effective targeting, ad formats, all that is a layer, but audience buying is something that we moved to from inventory buying and that has added a lot of value. So be it multiple DHPs or SSPs, ad exchanges and all, uh, DV360 still uh, holds a very big value whenever it comes to planning, be it programmatic uh, or uh, non-programmatic buyers also, we can work out on DV360. So uh, the targeting leverage, the deduplication leverage, non wastage of money, adding more value to the client's uh, advertising dollars. That is what programmatic has enabled us uh, over the past eight to 10 years. And uh, that is where we are also moving on. If you see uh, digital media has grown significantly on the base of programmatic itself in the past eight years. Before that, it was uh, crawling, lingering here and there on inventory buying. There were uh, agencies that would propose only those particular publishers they had uh, VDs or annual deals with. Today that is not the case. We are not stuck with individual publisher buying and programmatic through audience buying has given us that leverage. So from a media planner's point of view, uh, the media plans that are being made today are much more effective than they would have been without programmatic before. So that, that's the importance of programmatic in today's life. This is something that people might know, people might not know, but people, uh, people miss to address this, this biggest advantage of programmatic today. That's what I'll say. Very true, very true. I mean, media consolidation, right, plays a big role. And uh, it's, it's great to hear from you, right, uh, managing SIPLA, that how important is media consolidation, how it can actually save you a lot of monies, which can be reinvested to kind of reach to more users. And again, audience plays a big role as well, right? Without audience, I think it's a pure media buying. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example on that. So it's not uh, about reinvesting into media. While I'm on the brand side now and I look, at, I look at it from the brand manager's perspective as well, the brand, in the brand manager's, while if I'm in an agency, I'm a media planner, my entire circle of my work profile is media. Uh, when I look at it from the client's POV, media is a small part in the brand manager's entire portfolio. So if money is getting saved in media or supply chain or production anywhere, the person is able to prioritize, to put that money into priorities which are important for him, be it creating uh, a new uh, ad, be it uh, launching a new NPD or, or so on. So the monies that are, that media, digital media, so to say, has been able to save through programmatic have been very valuable to clients uh, okay. across multiple functions they, they work out. True, true, true that. Yeah. Great. So those are some really interesting stories on how, when and why of programmatic from brands and agencies. We would like to move to the next one, right, wherein I would love to hear some success stories, right, uh, on the programmatic front. Again, I would like to start with you, Sagat, on that. So, I'm afraid I'll not be able to give out actual numbers, right, uh, but I can say this. My role is actually a global role, so I'm responsible for uh, seven or eight primary markets. Uh, before we started it off programmatic uh, in, in data communications, digital's role, the way it used to be managed, I think, and uh, we've been touched upon it briefly, was here are X amount of dollars, go and get me so many leads and then we'll see what happens, right? It was very, very sporadic, very spray and pray, like I was saying earlier. Now, on the back of proper audience-based buying and targeting, uh, I still remember as a team, we were able to crack a deal with a customer and I'm talking enterprise B2B, right? So this, this deal was generated online and the, uh, the requirement was generated online. It was serviced mostly online over emails and uh, calls and communications. And I'm talking about the COVID uh, period and it was sold online. And uh, since then, it has it has now become a matter of uh, success for us, or a matter of habit for us, I might say, wherein on an average we are contributing close to 
about 8% of the company's new business uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. And I'm talking of numbers which are upwards of uh, a few few billions here, right? So with the kind, so the ROs, the ROI that we are getting, that we are able to demonstrate, the depth of engagement that we are able to demonstrate with the target group customers and the target accounts that we have, as well as the conversions that we are able to generate. And not only that, so it's not about marketing blowing its own trumpet here. I, I do uh, very frequent conversations with sales leaders across the different markets, right? And uh, right from the region head to the account manager who's in that particular account day in and day out, spending time with the customers, actually has come back and reported a very high level of awareness, a very high level of meaningful awareness, where they actually know what the company is, what the kind of propositions we are putting on the table, what kind of solutioning we are bringing to the table, and that has aided them in actually driving a lot more uh, business uh, driving conversations and, and closing deals. So uh, I think the point that you made was very valid. It's not only about putting money back into marketing or back, back uh, you know, uh, into uh, digital, but it's also about reinvesting it in business areas of priority, which, which has multiple uh, you know, outcomes uh, for the business as a whole. Got it, got it. So Sachin, I mean, just to add a layer onto the question, right? Uh, along with success stories, you already spoke about audiences, right? How important are creatives, right? When it comes to the overall success of the campaign, keeping in mind, right? As you said, rightly, from uh, the age before programmatic to programmatic, how the creatives have evolved and how are we using creatives as of now when it comes to programmatic to s get the success out of the campaign? That's a good question, but uh, honestly, there are a lot of challenges over there. First and foremost, challenges, challenge, uh, you being from the agency side, leading programmatic, you'll understand. Uh, brands don't understand programmatic that well. So making the, so it's basically a TVC that has been worked out to run on TV. That same video, for, I'm talking in context of FMCG and healthcare, they'll give me the same creative to be done on digital without understanding what is the extent to which programmatic can deliver in terms of creative optimization. So dynamic creative optimization is one small thing, but uh, multiple such uh, creative optimization measures can be taken upon programmatic, uh, saving advertising dollars again, and helping also you to understand which communication is working better with my consumer, or rather which consumer, so there are different consumer sets as well. If I, if I talk about doing an A-B testing using a, a script for, an, for a TVC with uh, audiences through any research agency, that might take one to one and a half months, maybe two months, and your consumer uh, pool is also very small. It's maybe 1,000, 1,500 at, at best. Uh, A-B testing is one of the most important things that Programmatic has uh, brought in, uh, saving a lot of time, saving a lot of advertising dollars. The brand is able to understand which script is working for them, which tagline is working for them, and that, that sort of a test which gets delivered in two to three weeks, they're able to then extrapolate it on a larger scale, be it on uh, out of home, TV, print, any other media platform. So, Creative uh, has certainly helped in terms of optimizations, which again, I would say we ignore. We do not, it's, it becomes a general, uh, you know, business as usual task uh, when it comes to, okay, this creative did perform in that certain manner. These 10 creators were there, let's continue with those and these will deliver to us. So uh, experimentation is something that is possible, but not many of us do that. Not, not many, many of us want to move out of the comfort zone and try those things out. So, I would still say it is very untapped uh, in the biggest advertiser space, which is FMCG and healthcare today. So creative optimization certainly helps, but it's untapped right now. Yeah, very important to do A-B testings, right? Understanding the overall uh, performance of the creatives uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, DCO moment marketing personalization is also very important, right? It gives you that, uh, what do you say, uh, flavor of being very close to the user that we are tapping into. Aditya, how has been, uh, what, what kind of success stories uh, have you seen on the programmatic front at your end? I think uh, we've deployed uh, programmatic, especially overseas. I think we've deployed programmatic channels in markets like Europe, USA, Canada. And I think we've seen encouraging results in terms of the, what the brand lift studies have sort of reported. Uh, we've seen lift in terms of awareness, we've seen lift in terms of consideration as well. So I think it's been a positive uh, sort of a results there. Just taking on the point on creative, I think from the creative, uh, obviously audience creatives, one cannot overstate their importance. It's the fundamental bedrock of what we do. Uh, at Airendia, I think we've taken extra steps uh, to ensure that we have the right alignment between the creative and the channel. 
So, like Sachin was mentioning, you know, there, were, there were days when you would just have a TVC and then that would get adapted into different mediums. Now I think the change that we've tried to incorporate in our setup is that we want to take the channel view first. And looking at the channel, we try and develop the creative strategy basis that. So it's a digital louder hooding versus an audio platform like a Spotify that we're kind of leveraging. Uh, the creative strategy essentially flows from there. So uh, we've tried to reverse the cycle in that sense, not have a creative first and then adapt it. Look at the channel first and then sort of figure out what's the right creative for it. So I think that seems to be working well for us and we hope to sort of continue on that. Good point. So choosing the right channel and the right creative for it and at the same time having the right tech in place to measure the performance of the overall campaign through brand lift studies and other tools as such. Great, great, Aditya. How, how, what about you, uh, Tushar? So I think coming from an agency side, we see a lot of success stories on a regular basis for our clients. And if you go by industry reports, and as Sachin mentioned that, you know, in 2015-16, when programmatic came into picture, there was very less ad adoption. And now in the course of 10 years, you will see that as per industry reports, there's almost 46% of the budget goes to programmatic in an average media plan. So I would say that that itself is a success story to look out for. And if I talk about Densu, we have seen legacy brands who used to spend hardly 2%, 5%, who started off with that kind of an experimentation budget and now spending up to 80% only on programmatic. The rest of the 20% is for the wall gardens, right? So again, there are, there are a lot of success stories we can talk about. One campaign I can talk about, again, it's not promoting Densu here, but yes, one of the things that, you know, most of the uh, client partners would have tried weather ads, but we did something different. Uh, for one of our white good brands, we did some innovation, which was on weather ads, wherein an APAC first innovation, wherein there is a weather trigger that gets triggered when there is certain conditions met, and you're able to see that campaign uh, in a CTV ecosystem, right? So it, it gave a lot of, it was very receptive, uh, we were able to reach more than a million unique households, viewability was great, completion rates were up to 90%, so right, so it was a very relevant and contextual way of targeting, and that is, I think that is something that I can quote right now. Great, great, API integrations to programmatic, right, and possible movement marketing as well. So maybe if I may just add a point here, uh, I think uh, when we talk about creatives, it's also very important to think about the brief, right? What programmatic has helped us do, given the data that we collect and the insights that we collect with respect to the to, to what was rightly said, what is working, what is not working. In data communications, we have actually now started making, of, not now, a couple of years hence, uh, it's been a couple of years, we have actually started integrating that as part of writing the brief. Because when we know that this works, why would we not give the agency that information as part of the brief and get them to come up with creatives and probably get it right the first time? Right, so that is another untouched benefit or or unknown or unheard of benefit of programmatic led data. You know that that is at the disposal of both the agencies and marketeers to to sh further sharpen their messaging, make it more contextually relevant, and drive higher engagement and hopefully conversions. Right, very true. I mean, not only analyzing the impression, clicks, and conversion data, looking at how creative has done, right? If it's a video creative, what has been the completion rates, what has been the engagement of the user on the creative, at which point is very important to learn and understand so that we can fine tune our future creatives. Good, good, great point, uh, Saugatha, on that. So moving on, right? Since we have already heard about the success stories, I would like you to share some key learnings, right, from your programmatic experience on the campaigns that you've run, and also, uh, would like to understand what what you would like programmatic to solve for uh, in brand storytelling uh, futuristically. Uh, should we start with you? I'll take that up. So I think uh, I can actually go on and on about the learnings that we have on a daily basis, but I'll keep it short in the interest of time. And two, three things that have been very crucial for us. One is data is the foundation, right? The richer the data, the better the quality of the data, the volume of the data that you feed into the machine, the better the outcomes. Because at the end of the day, it's all machine learning and AI at the back end. Right? So you have to let the machine work its magic. And after the, once it does, it's all set for you guys. Right? So one is data is the foundation. The second is on the creative part, which is creative matters a lot. While data and technology is at the back of it, it's very vital. But creative is very important. 
there are a lot of AI tools which helps you manage your creatives automation. You get a lot of insights that you can drive out of that and which is sometimes humanly impossible. You have to understand what kind of creative resonates with your audiences and basis that marketeers today are now able to develop uh, or devise a very uh, robust strategy around that. And one, uh, the last thing and the most important is also for the brands that you know that you always have to test and learn. Programmatic actually thrives on continuous learning and experimentation. So marketeers should always keep a budget aside, maybe 5%, 7% for experimentation. It helps the machine learn. It, gives, it helps you get better outcomes. And in the long run, it actually pays off. Fair, fair. I mean, in this rapidly evolving world, right, experimentation is key, right? Testing out things, keeping budget aside for it is very important. Very good. What about you, Sagar? So I would say the biggest uh, <clears throat> success that I have seen right, at a larger uh, le leadership level is programmatic has the power of communicating to the management that marketing is not a cost center anymore. Right? Because marketing can actually impact businesses and business outcomes. It can actually create the right perception which shortens sales cycles and can actually drive the home the message which positions the organization the way they want to be positioned. So that I think has been the biggest uh, demonstrable outcome that I have seen in, in the last four, four and a half years that I have been working actively here. Uh, in terms of learnings, I completely agree with what Tushar said. Uh, just because one strategy has worked for us uh, doesn't mean that we stick to that and continue to, you know, optim not optimize it. Uh, the, the, the ecosystem is evolving every day and therefore experimentation is the key. So consciously we try and keep a certain part of the budget uh, for experimentation. And the third uh, learning that I have had, you will get inputs from quarters you have never even thought of. Right? So because of the holistic nature of advertising and marketing, the way it's shaping up, doesn't mean that if you dis discuss uh, programmatic conversations or ideas with a tech inclined person in your creative agency and it has happened with us, we have got insights from them, right, which have helped us build and mount great campaigns. So that those would be my few cents on that topic. Great, great. So Sachin, I would like to, of course, you have shared few key learnings already, right? If there are any. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll touch upon two, two points over here uh, coming from uh, not a creative-led uh, uh, POV, but a media-led POV of how do we reach out to the right audiences, if I may say. So if I, if I give you a, I'll, I'll talk about a challenge as well and, and a success story. So uh, Nicotex is one of the flagship brands that Supply Health has and uh, it is also one of the brands, only brands rather, that uh, we desperately want to fail. We want Indians to quit smoking and Nicotex is not selling anymore. <laughs> so uh, what happens is uh, the brand team comes to me and it, it was for past uh, year, year and a half after I joined and they were like, hey, we want to reach out to smokers online. And I'm like, how do you get that data? So we, we can do uh, hyper-local targeting. I can reach out to, uh, you know, places like bars and pubs, put up a time filter of 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. I can reach out to corporate parks and areas around that from 10 to 6 in the evening and so on. But that again is spray and pray. Uh, just like TV, I'm just sharpening it a bit through hyper-local targeting. Uh, the brand again came up with a question that I want to reach out to smokers who intend to quit smoking. That is my TG for Nicotex. That is the right, uh, that is the sharpest TG that they can reach out to. So uh, we had discussions with our agency and uh, one thing just clicked to us that that targeting is sitting right out there. We never used it in the past uh, few years, which is uh, apography targeting. So there are multiple apps out there which help people to quit smoking. Uh, they, they have tutorials, they have videos, they have reminders. They, they have uh, journals where you put that, okay, this, the, these many less cigarettes I smoked today and this is the time when I quit, when, when I did not smoke this cigarette of the day and so on. So if through apography targeting, I can reach out to consumers who have those apps on their phone. And we were surprised that there are 5 million plus uh, audiences that I can reach out to who have downloaded such apps on their phone. Indian Smoker Universe is around 3 to 3.5 CR, cigarette smokers. Uh, overall smoking universe is 10 CR plus. So that itself helped me to reach out to a specific set of audiences. Now, uh, the brand managers understand the TV lingo pretty well. So if I say uh, awareness to trial ratio, that is something that comes from a TV advertising background. So through this sort of a targeting on YouTube and ODD platforms, we were able to provide an awareness to trial ratio, which is better than TV advertising to them, which helped the brand to move its monies from TV to digital. 
So a challenge was there, a solution was lying there, we, we could not observe it, we tried it out and it delivered. So this is one of a good success stories on Nicotex that we have. And uh, on a, a second point that I would like to touch, so if you see digital uh, video universe has been very fragmented. So the OTTs of the world don't talk to each other, they're wall gardens. YouTube doesn't talk to them. YouTube on its own is very big, all of them combined don't compete with YouTube. It is during the COVID times when there was business distress, these guys, uh, the OTT platforms, they agreed to share their inventory on DSPs, on programmatic. Through device ID, uh, you know, integration, we were able to unify the audiences on OTT. So that was a unified frequency on OTT that we were able to get. Now, DV360 also allows this. They have listed their inventory on DV360. So OTT platforms and YouTube put together, I today, say Facebook aside, I today have a digital video universe minus Facebook, which, can com which is comparable to TV uh, video universe. So that is where programmatic has grown in the past four years, so to say. So of course, there are challenges in learning and there are multiple opportunities that we can hop upon. Just that we need to uh, engage, the brand needs to engage more with the agencies. I, I don't see that there is as much engagement that is required for the brands to grow. The programmatic, as I said before, is not that much tapped into right now as much it can be. Right, right. There, there's so many other layers to it as well, right? I mean, as you rightly mentioned, we have to keep our eyes open to figure out what's there exactly in the programmatic that we can leverage on. See, my, my point is the agency has those answers. Brand is not coming up with questions. The fair, engagement fair. is not that high, is what, right, I, right, what right, I'm trying to pitch right. here. Aditya, what about you? I think uh, from an India perspective, I think we've been, I would say, pretty nascent in our usage of programmatic. Uh, so I think uh, any brand out there who's just starting off with programmatic or still kind of early days into programmatic journey, uh, I can sort of call out two key challenges that we're kind of grappling with. One is the way you measure it, right? I mean, uh, if you're starting off in programmatic and you're just early days for you, uh, you will not be used to, uh, you cannot apply the same principles of measurement that you are used to applying to other channels for programmatic as well. I think it's, uh, it's a different world, it's required a different sort of a measurement framework. And I think that's something one needs to sort of learn and maybe adapt depending on the industry that they're kind of operating in. That's one big challenge that we are also grappling with and I think any other brand who's just thinking of ramping up in programmatic would have to eventually encounter. And the second thing is obviously this new thing of the cookie-less transition. Uh, as it is, I think, I was reading a survey, I think about 70% of the brands were surveyed and, uh, sorry, brand was surveyed 70% of them responded that they were not ready for the cookie-less transition. Uh, and I think the remaining 30% who said they were, I think they were just sort of uh, not admitting to it. Um, and I think that's very, very much the fact, right? I mean, uh, I don't think all of us have fully grasped the gravity of impact that will have in our lives, right? Especially for big uh, D2C brands, you know, and who have like millions and millions of cookie data coming in. I think for them, the life uh, post the sunset would be very different and I think programmatic is no different from any other channel from that regard. So I mean, just the way you kind of prepare for that post cookie world for your traditional channels, I think you need to sort of shore up your defenses for that as well. I think that's the two things that I think we are currently grappling with and I think would, as a word out to all the fellow marketers, I think that's something they should also watch out for. Yeah, first party data is going to play a big role. I just wanted to add to it, add to that point. So cookie-less uh, world will be there soon. Uh, it is being discussed and so on. But there's a lot of first-party data that brands are setting upon. In fact, there's a lot of cookie data that brands are setting upon which they are not using. Retargeting campaigns hardly the guy they plans me. You must have also seen. Uh, but first-party data is the answer. You can so even though the first-party data is as small as 15, 20,000 or as big as one million plus, uh, effectively using the first-party data, even though it might not be a cookie-less world, the, the advantages, the benefits that users of first-party data will bring to the table, maybe brands might stop using cookie data completely, basis that. Right, right. So, I think, I think some great insights from all of you, right, right from data, audience, creatives, to first-party data and cookie-less world. Thank you so much for sharing your sto success stories and insights. I think it has been a really insightful session for me and for the audience as well. Uh, I, I think 
will be out there and each panelist is available out there for any discussion that you want to have, we are up there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir.